And so uh, with that, I would like to now formally introduce uh, our, our speaker for today. Um, it is Dr. Kate um, Sika Nitsa um, from the University of Zurich. And uh, she will be talking about uh, a very important topic, which is who owns Swiss firms and why does it matter? It relates to corporate governance. And she is truly an expert in, in corporate governance. She is a, an academic with a strong background in this area. And in terms of her formal education, <coughs> she holds a master in communication science from the University of Zurich and a PhD in international management from the uh, Hoke Schule St. Gallen and is a recipient of the Swiss National Science Foundation and the European Union's Marie Curie IEF Fellowships. Kate received a part of her training and conducted investigations at the Kellogg School of Management, the W.P. Carey School of Business, and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She has almost 10 years of research experience in the areas of ownership structure, shareholder activism, and firm valuation. And so with that, I'd like to now hand it over to Kate. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, an interesting group. It's first, it's, I've done a lot of talks in front of different audiences, but I've never talked in front of uh, financial analysts. And I have to tell you, I don't do this type of research, but you are a very important <coughs> category in our research. So we oftentimes, we have a lot of models where we look at, you know, how do analysts actually impact what happens in companies. So I see this really as, a, as an interactive endeavor. I invite you really to challenge me, um, to make remarks, to ask questions. Um, as you have heard, I am an academic, so you know, I, can't, I can't spare you off a little bit of theory. It's just in my nature. I would not be myself while talking about theory. Um, I think when it comes to say and pay and ownership, particularly on compensation, it's important because you know, nowadays, compensation structures have become so crazy, none of the same mind, except an academic, would come up with something like that. So I really think we actually invented um, say and pay. Uh, so we invented compensation. Um, in terms of, I was going to mention maybe a couple of words of corporate governance, um, how, you know, what I've been doing, um, what kind of research I've been doing in this area. Um, I was, we were the first, um, when I started my PhD, well, even before that, um, Switzerland, there was no, Switzerland had no code of corporate governance. So back then there was no, there was no data. And as researchers we rely on data. What we want, you're going to see, we always want to have, you know, some kind of numbers to crunch and some kind of, you know, um, variables to put in our regression models. And, uh, well, some 10 years ago, in 2002, Switzerland has introduced, it has introduced the first code of corporate governance. And that was the starting point that was when we as researchers could actually, you know, get, you know, get data on compensation, to some extent compensation, you know, patchy, however it was, but, you know, board data, board compensation, but also ownership structure. And um, that was 10 years ago, and that's when we started collecting data, and I still have that same data set. So basically my data set uh, is, I started doing it uh, for my dissertation. Um, it's really, um, you know, nitty gritty work, sitting, you know, kind of really looking at, at annual reports and kind of, um, um, why we're doing this hand collect is because it's also viable. You don't, don't go and kind of pull it out of the data set because, you know, some journals require it. It's really um, so um, I, I see corporate governance as a vast topic, um, including ownership, um, compensation, and boards. Um, and I've specialized in, in, in ownership. And what I'm looking at is basically, you know, how are companies, how is the ownership structure of companies um, composed? Um, how, why do shareholders behave the way they behave? How they impact governance and the strategy in companies? Um, when do they engage in activism? How do they pick their targets? And today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, who owns Swiss firms. This is about you know, the size of shareholdings and why does it matter. 
Um, and I'm going to, to use a case in point. So, um, in order to understand how, um, how ownership impacts corporations, we need an example. And since we just uh, voted on the anti-ripoff initiative, it's supposed to, to, um, to, to, to come out as a law in November, and we're now about to vote on 1 to 12, I thought it's a good example. Um, to, to, to say a couple of words of why ownership matters. Um, I'm going to provide you with a set of descriptive statistics. Um, we did run models, but I'm not presenting them there. I thought it's probably a little too crazy still. A um, number of words about data that's, you know, due diligence. That's what we have to do as researchers. It's a we've conducted hand collected um, ownership data of 135 largest Swiss companies with market cap listed on, on the Swiss Stock Exchange. Um, the data source is really annual reports. So whatever you see comes out of the annual report. It has to be this way because when we, you know, when we do research and submit to journals, they want to know where the data comes from. You have to have a, the same source for all the data. And it's basically we have looked at significant shareholders. So that's the numbers that we picked out. And those are usually the ones, well, those are the ones our requirement have more than three percent of shareholders. Very important, we collected data on voting rights, on the voting rights, not on cash flow rights. These are two different things in Swiss context, right? So bear in mind, whatever you see, it's control rights. It's not, it's not um, shares. It's really, you know, the number of votes that you have. And the time period is 2006 and 2011. I'm going to present you with the three key insights. Uh, one concerns incentives of shareholders to capture their property rights, to vote their shares. Um, another insight concerns the heterogeneity. That's what we call heterogeneity. It's really about um, shareholder interests, different types of shareholders, and how they diverge in terms of interest. And the third uh, insight is about expropriation. It's what we call expropriation. It's, it's um, <coughs> the problems and difficulties that minority shareholders might incur, depending on the on ownership, or given ownership structure. I'm going to provide you with uh, two conclusions. One concern, concerns what can we expect from a binding say, from a from a binding say of pay in Switzerland from the Octo Initiative. And the second conclusion is that's all the experiment for me. I thought you might be interested in that as analysts. So what is a well-owned company? If not well-governed, what is a well-owned company? Please feel free to jump in, make remarks, questions, whatever. I really prefer an interaction. It's 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 you know, it's more. Interesting. So, say on pay, fear and hope. What is this about? <laughs> Case in point, I think that's the, it's a premise to the economist. You know, that's for fair academic purposes, we do steal every now and then. Um, <laughs> um, what's the point? So, I call it say on pay. It's something that came over to our context from the UK, 2002, I think, was the first um, say on pay. Um, um, event or you know idea came up in UK and general idea is that um, we need to empower shareholders through more rights and more bounded binding rights so we need to give them more rights um, and we need to make this binds these these rights binding and the underlying belief is, is that shareholders are actually a white shot they have a discipline what we call discipline effect on excessive salaries so that's the basic idea. Power shareholders, why? Because they have an interest to watch over executive compensation and make sure, we're going to talk about why, that these salaries are not excessive. Now, given this, knowing more and who owns shares in Switzerland and how much means actually knowing who will have a say on pay in Switzerland. So that was our basic idea uh, to look at these. Issues. And again, I have three different topics I'm going to touch upon. One is concentration and incentives. The other is heterogeneity and the third is expropriation. And if we start with concentration and incentives, I'm going to provide you with the inside number one right away. And if you don't believe me, please say so. And why? <laughs> um, well, I claim Swiss shareholders have enough incentives to engage in saving pay. Why are incentives important? What are incentives? Well. You know, the idea is you can give people rights to do 
whatever you want, but you have to have some kind of motivation. Um, when it comes to shareholders, it's usually financial <laughs> motivation to actually use these rights. Now, the idea is, and that's a little academic, um, using property rights or you know monitoring is a is a is a public good. Which means the costs are borne by one shareholder, the benefits accrue to the entire shareholder base. <clears throat> so the point here is if you're a small shareholder, your dominant strategy is exit, why would you go on and vote? You know? And now please, you know, think about how much we've been talking about this up till and how important it is that shareholders vote their share. Well, look, if you're a small shareholder, you, you, what, why would you vote if you're dissatisfied with the company? Sell your shares. You know, you don't have any problems anymore. So we call this the dominant strategy is exit instead of voice. It follows from this that on the large shareholders, those that have significant block of shares in one company have an incentive to vote. And this even more so because they cannot easily sell. If they sell, this is going to depress the share price and thus their own wealth. You know, we can talk about thresholds, but that's not that important. The important is if you're small, they're going to sell. But, you know, in order to actually force shareholders or kind of expect of shareholders to vote their, share, their shares, you have to, you know, you, would, you have to look at large shareholders. Um, Liquidity and control trade off. Just to mention that many, many, many shareholders, particularly institutional investors, they don't want control. They keep their shareholdings below 5%, <coughs> below 3%, so as to be able, you know, not, not have to disclose, as to be able to sell off. What I'm trying to say, you know, whenever someone tells you, say, you pay an ownership structure, bear in mind you need incentives, right? So um, if you go to the uh, US or UK context, they will have, they have a different ownership structure. The ownership structure tends to be way more dispersed. And then there they would tell you, well, shareholders lack incentives if they have you know, a very diverse portfolio so they can hedge risk. Here, you know, you would, this is why I say, incentives work in Switzerland. Because as we're gonna see, we have a high ownership concentration. This means ownership concentration and dispersion, the level of ownership concentration is going to provide you information of, on how likely it is that shareholders are going to use their rights. Okay, so let's have a look, now that we know this, let's have a look um, how shareholdings look uh, in, the, uh, in the Swiss context. So very much 135 watches over um, in a period 2006 to 2011. What we see here, that's the average number of voting rights, right? So in Switzerland, on average, this is the largest shareholder, the second largest, the third largest. On average, the largest shareholder holds about 30% of voting rights. I mean, that's huge. And that's giant. But I have to tell you, it's way less than the Anglo-Saxon context. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's more than in the Anglo-Saxon context, but it's less than Germany, less than Austria, less than... Um, I had numbers, Chris asked me to provide numbers, I had numbers, the problem is everybody does this for his, her own research purpose, so they're not exactly comparable. And some, some, some use different thresholds, but I can tell you, Germany, we can speak of 40%. Italy, Austria, so this is, you know, big, but, you know, it's, it's not even the largest level of concentration. So it's one shareholder? So this would be the largest shareholder. This would be the second largest shareholder. This would be the third largest shareholder. On average, on average, over the 135. And you take this market cap weighted, or is, or is, a, is an average of each individual company? Each individual, average of each individual company. If you look at the SMI, yes, as an example. And it takes, uh, it takes the, when you take the big companies to. You know, they're always 20% of the company that makes all of this one. Is the same average? So this is it's a good question. Thank you. This is the 135. It's an average. We all know averages are kind of, not, not not median. It's, it's an average. Excuse me. Um, SMI companies, pretty much the same. SMI companies, you have Novartis, you have Nestle, with almost 0% of shareholdings. But bear in mind, SMI, it's Roche. It's entirely in public hand. It's Adico. It's, um, I mean, beside Nestle and Novartis, I don't know all the 20 SMIs for yes, heart. Yes, yes. um, UBS has the sovereign fund. You know, the bailout sovereign Singapore fund. 
credit suisse, I think, has a state. I mean, you know, we're talking everything that's below 5%. So all these companies, I don't know, beside the two, have one bondholder. It's probably not 30%. But I mean, Russia's, you know, by the family is 51%. The second Joseph Excuse me? The second Joseph yeah. But again, yeah, that, that's the expropriation issue. But I mean, do you deal with the free float? How do you deal with the free float? I mean, the, the percentages of, of shares that are not uh, traded or... Uh, <coughs> that, I'm not sure if I can answer this question. So this is the significant shareholders. This is, if you, it's, it's the voting rights. It's the voting rights in the hand of the larger shareholder on average. You know, you might have many, many questions, you know, this is why I mentioned the data at the beginning. You know, I can only tell you what the annual reports tell you. And you might have a lot of detailed questions that I can't ask because I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to have a data set that's equal for all companies. So the annual reports, it's the disclosure requirement is disclose every shareholder about. And, and you can collect shareholdings or voting rights, these other voting rights. So does that, yeah. does that answer your question? Do you also have data in terms of, of uh, which companies that have these large um, shareholders uh, are also actively involved in the management of the company? Because it's one thing to have a big shareholder, um, and it's another thing if that big shareholder is also part of the management. Um, we have, a, I'm going to show you a slide on board involvement. So in a category that's called um, shareholders on board. Um, the management category, that's a matter of retrenchment, they appear to the extent that they're individual shareholders. But you know, this is really, these are really you know, above 3%. As, as managers, it takes really a lot of shares via compensation to accumulate this, this, this large amount. So the levels of retrenchment by executives is not that high, so it's not. You know, in some, in some U.S. context, over, you know, I don't know, 20 years of variable compensation or, you know, long-term incentive plans, CEOs tend to have accumulated large, large stock. In Switzerland, that's not the case. I mean, they don't appear on the more than 3%. Right. It, but it, board members do. Exactly. As you rightly pointed out, it's, it's different in Anglo-Saxon countries because you have the classic examples of, like, Bill Gates, right. Steve Jobs, entrepreneurs right. who, are, who were the, the largest shareholders in, in their firms. And were entrepreneurs, but their interests were closely aligned with those of shareholders because they were running the company. Right, was, right. They, were, they were the largest shareholder. Yeah, right. Or even you know, non-founders, which just accumulated a large level of shareholdings um, over time via long-term incentive plans. I mean, the U.S. context not that the case. You know, where you become um, so to make it a little vignette, um, I once. I conducted a research project in, in Germany where we had to interview um, top executives and board members. And there was one board member uh, who was a, you know, a very prominent person in the German context, and I found it interesting. He tells me, you know, we had activist shareholders because you know, sharehold, you know, being activist, having a say in companies' affairs has become very illegitimate. Twenty years ago, you wouldn't do that. No one would speak up, but now it's kind of you know, it's it's cool to do that. So this um, this guy tells me this um, really really high-profile individual tells me, you know, sometimes I have small activists, people who own 10 shares, and then he shows up at the younger general meeting and tells me, I'm an owner, and then I say, do you know how much I own through years and years and years of exit compensation? You're, you know, that exists. So, you know, so they, the executives can become an important shareholder, but, you know, we're going to see, it's what Sunday, they're not, the most meaningful category is this one. I think the numbers are pretty high. Again, it's uh, lower than in Germany, Italy, Austria, and so on and so forth. But it's um, uh, in, in the Anglo-Saxon context, it's lower than in, but it's way higher than the Anglo-Saxon. This ten percent doesn't include the part where a bank holds in the half. Um, yes. It's not part of that. It is part. Of, well, I have two categories. I have. Um, Institutional investor and I have bank. And if that is a sandy increase the bank. Yes. So whenever they, whenever this the disclosed, whenever they disclosed the um, significant shareholder, I coded the identity. Maybe if you go on you're, you're gonna see the identities. You know, I have a slide with who owns how much. 
Okay. I mean, another another important question here is, let's move on. You, it's, some of the questions are going to be uh, in terms of who who, who was what twelve minutes old. Let me maybe quickly, because incentives are important. So bear in mind, the incentives is really how, to, to what extent will you be willing, you will you have an interest to actually vote. Look, if you hold 30% of a company, you know, you can't just sell. I mean, it's kind of difficult, because if you sell, everybody else is going to sell. So you're going to want to have a same thing, right? So um, that means we have a fairly high level of ownership concentration in Switzerland. As I just said, the SMI companies are not significantly different. These are some numbers for the rest. So we have even these, these cases, right? That's totally unknown in the Anglo-Saxon context. Um, international comparison, as I said, it's, uh, it's a medium level. It's really Switzerland is usually situated in the middle. So you would have the Anglo-Saxon context here, and you would have uh, you know, the uh, relational the Rhineish system here in Switzerland somewhere in the middle, and that's pretty much mirrored in the ownership structure. Um, yeah, what's noteworthy, I had a nice um, graph here, but I decided to show it. it's a little complicated. If you count, if you sum, if you look at the concentration rates, and if you sum the three largest shareholders, again, over the average, 135 companies, then you, you, you can see that 38% of these 100, 135 companies the majority vote. I mean, that's kind of funny, right? I mean, tell this to your American colleagues. And in Switzerland, a coalition of three can design everything in 38% 30, of the largest companies. I mean, you know, speaking of disciplining effect, it's, I think it's interesting. And um, well, some of my American colleagues don't believe that. It's, it's really um, stunning. Coming to types, I'm going to talk a little bit about types. Um, heterogeneity and preferences. Second topic that matters. Well, let me provide you with, with an insight. Institutional investor monitoring, and we are very much influenced by the Anglo-Saxon doctrine here, is where institutional investors, particularly also pension funds, I think everybody knows the buzzword Calperson and Calsters and all that. The insight number two from our descriptive, descriptive statistics is that institutional investor monitoring is relatively modest, suggestive of a weaker pay performance relationship than in other contexts. Um, let me explain this a little bit. So in order to understand that, so many, you know, when, when it comes to say and pay, when it comes to up to opportunity, for example, or anti-ripoff initiatives, the people typically think about this in terms of level of pay. You know, they want to cap the level of pay. What often goes forgotten in this discussion, when it comes to say on pay, say on pay by shareholders, this is not so much about the level of pay, the absolute level, it's really pay for performance. It's the link between compensation and performance. And uh, in my discussion with you know, people around me, this kind of got a little lost. So it, when, you, when you ask people, so what are you gonna vote you know, for the anti ripoff initiatives, and then they would go, well, you know, you know, I want to lower, I want, I'm, I'm against excessive salaries. I'm going to vote yes, but then you go, but you know, it's not capping excessive salaries. It's really about the link between pay and performance, right? So this is what we want to achieve. This is, you know, what say on pay, what you know, shareholders say on pay wants to achieve, assuming that shareholders share that stock price or other performance accounting performance. They're correlated. Um, Executive compensation is a governance mechanism, and it's a means, you know, the structure of executive compensation, a means of aligning the interests of executives with the interests of shareholders. So what we are interested in, it's what we call preference, uh, what we call um, sensitivity between pay and performance. For every dollar right of $1,000 value increase in shareholder wealth, you would expect company, uh, executive compensation to go up by one study clients, 32%. But you would expect the opposite. So when performance goes down, pay should go down. So that's what we wish or hope for when it comes to um, executive compensation, uh, say on pay. However, and that's what I mean by um, heterogeneity, we know from management research, it's not that much financial doctrine, it's really management research, that shareholders have heterogeneous preferences. Right? So the standard model would assume every shareholder cares about stock price performance, full stop, that's it. We 
know that's not exactly the case. Uh, all, all shareholders care, care about <coughs> company performance, yes. But they differ in investment horizons, they differ in disposition towards risk, and they differ in their attachment, in their you know, proximity, or, or, or have, you know, proximity or binding with the company. And that impacts a lot of what kind of pay structure they prefer. That impacts also how tolerant they are for short-term performance declines. Now, when it comes to this, for example, attachment, take a family. How low does the performance have to fall before, you know, they're going to sell off and, you know, get rid of the company? It takes a long time, right? Um, take a government owner, right? It's a giant investment horizon. So if you have long investment horizons, you know, and for a hedge fund, long is six years. For a government owner, you know, but when the state is involved, this is 30, 40, 40, 50 years. That impacts the structure of your pay. You're going to have more LTIPs, right? You're going you're gonna to try to kind of provide your executives with incentives that are congruent with your, with your interests, right? The same holds true. I mean, there is, there is a bunch of research on that. The same holds true for disposition towards risk. You know, if you are risk averse as a shareholder, then you're going to structure the compensation such that executives have less incentives to, you know, invest in risky decisions. Some shareholders, for example, um, don't want executives to invest in R&D too much because it doesn't pay out, you know, immediately. So they're trying to say, you know, the, the kind of take out from this is really very much shareholders have heterogeneous preferences. Now, when we award shareholders to say on pay, well, not first he needs an incentive, right? But then we have to know, okay, what is his interest? How much does he care about performance? What is his investment horizon? How attached is he to the company? That makes him you know how objective he is. Um, what's his disposition position towards risk? And this is going to impact pay structure. Not so much to a little level with the pay structure. Now if you look at the distribution of shareholder types with these heterogeneous preferences, we can say something about how um, you know how um, how is rewarded what is rewarded in hell. And this Pablo I hope is maybe going to answer some of your questions. I don't know. So I looked at 2011, and I don't want to overload you with graphs. It's pretty much the same in 2006. It hasn't changed. So I even have a graph somewhere here. Uh, so if you look at the 2011, the distribution of large shareholder types, this is it. So I have institutional investor as the largest category. Family owners, governmental owners, large individual investors. That would be someone like Victor Wechselberg. And then large shareholders with a seat on the board. So these can be, you know, individuals who got a seat on the board, but can also be a board member. Or actually, you know, typically if you're involved in the company for a long time, you sit on the board. Um, this is an interesting category for research purposes because, you know, they, this is, they tend to get trenched. They have way more access to information, and they don't necessarily need, you know, the kind of performance say, and pay mechanisms because, you know, they're sitting on the board. And this is a fairly large, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a fairly large um, category. Now, bear in mind, that's the largest shareholder. This is the distribution, just the distribution of types of largest shareholders. If you look at the second largest, I mean, you can go down to the third, and I have the data this until from fifth. What happens, which you see here, is that the institutional investor category is rising. So yes, we do have a lot of institutional investors. And if you look at this fifth largest shareholders, they're all institutions. You know, black rock fidelity, you name it. You know? However, they don't share, they don't hold hold that many shareholders. And that's an important insight if you believe in the disciplining effect of institutions. So that's what we know from the Anglo Saxon context, where you know sixty percent of you know all shares is, is in, in the market is somehow held by institutions. You have no other block holders. You have no large families. But in Switzerland, even though they are a frequently occurring type, on average, they're not the largest block holder. This is the largest investor, who the largest investor is. 
and it's often the family, another company, the state, a shareholder, and least frequently institutional investor. So even if you hold 5%, but you have a family that holds 30%, or you're in a company where the third, three largest hold 50%, it's kind of difficult for you to, you know, to, to, to enforce something. When you say other companies, it relates to cross shareholders? Yeah, and, and vertical horizontal integration. In Switzerland, they have mm -hmm. that? In Germany? In Switzerland. Yeah. I mean, that's what they have. And, uh, and here, yeah. Sorry, the shareholder will sit on the book and explain again what, what is the reason the last large individual investor. The large individual investor does not sit on the board. This is, it's a little bit of an artificial category. I could have looked at this one, but I didn't want to because, again, this is a shareholder that appears as a significant shareholder but has a seat on the board. You know, this is the large individual. That if you look at the company report and it says, holds above 30%. And then you look, you have a name because it's an individual. And then we would go back and look, okay, this is it on the board. Many, many, many shareholders, many large shareholders, particularly foreigners, foreign shareholders, they want to sit on the board. Actelion was a very prominent example, you know, where, where a fund or an investment fund uh, jumped in and wanted a seat on the board. So usually large investors, large institutions, they or they want the, uh, the people. But if you board. consider both of them together, it should be the largest one. But it's still not an institution. That was my point. You know, that's that's fair enough. I mean, that's that's the Victor Wechselbergs of these of this world. You know, the Carl Icons or Icons um, institutions. That's what everybody is talking about. That's what the Anglo-Saxon context is talking about. The disciplining effect of institutions. Why? I mean, family. You know, in Switzerland, my dissertation was on the sensitivity between performance and CEO turnover. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous if your son sits on, you know, if your son is the CEO, you're never going to sack him. That doesn't happen. You know, so the disciplining effect, for example, if you look at the likelihood that a CEO is going to get dismissed for poor performance, this only happens when you have a large institutional investor. I mean, you know, the sensitivity, it's always in degrees, you know. The likelihood rises if you have a disciplining effect, but only by an institution. And this, interesting enough, in the Swiss context, in 2011, but it wasn't very different in 2006, it wasn't very different in 2000. Um, you know, institutions don't hold that many shares. Well, you know, they, they, they are a frequent occurrence, but they are very seldom the largest shareholder. Yeah, I'm very surprised by the first line, other companies. Mm -hmm. Other com companies. Mm -hmm. Vertical integration, horizontal integration, being being involved. Can you give an example of the SMF for Russian varieties? For mm, Rush, no. That's a family company, but you would have, for example, um, who owns who, which bank owns Bank Corp, for example? That's like Cantonal Bank. For example, yeah. That we that that's something we call that because it's not a fund. But it's not an asset management, it's really a bank being involved. And you have plenty of this, yes. That's what's in. But that means that, I'm not sure to understand the, the, the calculation. Uh, in Switzerland, if I took all the companies, I mean, the majority of them are held by other companies. Am, am I correct? No, it's if you look at the largest shareholder. Okay. So you have to, if you, if you think, an Excel sheet. Yeah, I know okay. it's a little complicated, so that's 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 the research thing. It, it, you, if you think of, a, of an Excel sheet, yeah. and you have to code. Then you would have, you know, largest shareholder, second largest shareholder, third largest shareholder. Okay. That's how the database is okay. And then you look in the annual report, you know, significant shareholder, and you have number one holding 50% and the name. Yeah. That would be the largest shareholder. And then number two would hold 12%, number, number three would hold. Yeah. And that's what we collected. So we took the largest shareholder in each company, okay. we looked who he is, so code it. Is it a company? Is it an owner? Okay. State? State can be Cantonal Bank, by yeah. the way, it can be AGL, it can be Swisscom, something like that. Okay. Purposes. And then we would average it, which is a little nasty. It's, it's an average, not a median, it's mm -hmm. an average. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's how these numbers come about. Okay. And it's the largest. When you say institutional investor, what exactly you put, uh, are you putting? 
Paulo is always two steps ahead of me. Thank you. <laughs> I love this. Um, yeah, good question. Thank you. So, so who are institutional investors? And again, we're looking at this is important, you know, to back your question. So it's bear in mind it's the larger shareholder, the one that holds I mean we could break it down for every shareholder. It doesn't, you know, have a it's not so exciting. I mean I have all the graphs, but it, it, Excuse me. Could you make a weighted average of those numbers, for example? What would you determine? Uh, I mean, if you you see that um, another company owns so much of a given company, uh, and then you multiply. Uh, what well, you, you take? Uh, how we do that? Well, you take the wait. capitalization of each company, and then you would multiply the percentage by the capitalization. And then you would sum that and divide by the total capitalization. I guess you could do that. The question is just what you know. What what do you want to show? Well, the percentage of shares, which is owned by companies yeah. in France. You know, for one thing, these are voting rights. Uh -huh. You know, and that's 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 two different things. You know what I mean? So it's you can in, in Switzerland one share of one vote is not exactly a okay. very you know? So waiting you could wait it I guess why I have the bare numbers, it's really because I was interested in say on pay. So say on pay, frankly you know, where is say on pay important? Where do we have excessive salaries? It's the SMI companies. Well, it's not entirely company, but it's the big ones. You know? <coughs> so, um, you want to have the 135 largest, that's even too large a number. I mean, it comes to excessive compensation, we could actually look at the only SMI companies, basically. Um, so, you know, I thought, what I'm interested in is, is the percentage of voting rights. You know, how many voting rights do they hold? But I guess, yes, you could. I think why we didn't wait it is because we, we you know, we, the, the, the aim is a regression analysis. You know, regress ownership structure and performance and look which companies perform better depending on the, on the, on the, on the ownership structure. I, I guess I have no other, you know, answer to that. We didn't wait, it, we could, yeah, maybe. But it's all different. And this this may be something you're going to talk about uh, later, but one one issue that you have um, for a country like Switzerland is you tend to have people who sit on multiple boards, mm -hmm. and so you, you don't have the same let's say diversity of, of board membership that you have mm -hmm. let's say in, in other countries. And um, to use the classic example of, um, of uh, Swiss Air, you know, where you have it was a very cozy board. And so you didn't really have perhaps the, the best oversight of, of the management during during the, mm -hmm. the, the crisis for, for Swiss Air. Uh, do do you have um, data um, in terms of like the number of, of board members who sit on multiple boards? You the know? board interlocks. Exactly, because that 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 creates perhaps a, a very cozy atmosphere mm -hmm. that's less conducive for strong corporate governance. Right. Um, I have data from 2002 things. 2006, and now we are um, torturing little students to collect like, <laughs> part of the data set. So that could be the next talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, boards, or and this is really ownership structure, we are about now to collect data from 2006 to 2011 on the structure of corporate boards. Um, in terms of interlocking directorships, um, that has decreased a lot from 2000 to 2006. I don't know by heart, but I would expect that it's that the problem is not that serious. So it's become less less of an issue? Recently. You know, I was thinking when Ackermann resigned from Siemens and from Zurich, I was thinking maybe this interlocking stuff we should look at the DAC, you know, DAC states, not just at one context. Because to me, it seems that, you know, you're kind of, but I, I, I mean, it's definitely become less of, an, less of an issue than it was. Definitely, and then you have this, you know, um, kind of diversity um, discussion. So I mean, 
I think there are still a number of interlock directors, but way less than in 2000. But we're, we're about to collect that. Topic you for, for another presentation. Topic for another presentation. And by the way, much of the critics on um, saying pay is really to say, well, you know, we should not prepare our shareholders to have boards. You know, s stop, you know, ignoring boards. Boards are the ones who are, who should, you know, do the monetary function. Boards are the delegates of shareholders. And when it comes to this, then obviously you don't want to boards that are interlocked, but do, you know, um, the, the do each other's favors and so on. To what extent do you observe differences in time in this graph before and after the crisis, for instance, because you have data from 2006? Um, these numbers has, haven't changed drastically. I mean, I, I, um, I can. Can I quickly finish this slide? I have another slide with which is. Just here, what I wanted to show you. Is Would you say that pension fund have really a low impact yes. in Switzerland? That's a reminder yes. has almost yes. missed his target. Yes. Because forcing them to vote. Is, yes. It's good for yes. talk, but not so much for. Uh, well, you probably will yes. comment so, a bit on so that. This is what I was at. coming back on the three, two, six, and two, eleven. Okay. I have a slide I'm going to show it. But maybe to finish this one, this this is what I was going to say. It's exactly what you point out. Um, um, I'm writing this article, Chris knows this, for, uh, you know, Finanz und Wirtschaft. And there I was going to talk about this topic. So all of a sudden look at the data and I think, well, you know what, it's kind of weird. So we have the largest shareholders, we have pension funds, and they're really, really somewhere, I think, here. You know, it's not many. It's, it's, it's all, it's 37 institutions that are large shareholders in the 135 and 10.8% of pension funds. You know, so I call up Claudio Custa from the Uptalk Initiative <laughs> because I'm writing a newspaper article, I'm a researcher, it has to be, you know, watershed, you have to have evidence. So I call him up and I say, you know, how is it with this, you know, enforcement of pension fund voting? <laughs> and he goes, why is it? But, you know, it's not really fancy, it doesn't mean there's so, so few pension funds and you're imposing, imposing on all pension funds, it's a giant cost. You know, it's really, it's a huge issue, right? They're aware of that. So you might know that Somaruga has a, you know, there is, they, they have abandoned that a little bit. It's sort yeah, of the final law, the, the final law should not have. You should not go to jail. No. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's maybe someone who knows more about this. No, I don't, I don't know more, but, but I have another question. Do you know how much of the pension fund, of the investment funds are exercising the voting rights? We don't have the, mm, there is no disclosure on that. I don't have data on that. What I have, um, I don't have the graph here, but ETHOS, the ETHOS fund, um, they published recommendation, they published a percentage of votes in favor of pay in the last, of SMI companies in the last three years. Um, this year, you might know, we had two companies that got rejected, that's had a no, and it was uh, Julius Baer and... Actino. and uh, Actino. Yeah, Actino, exactly. And what you can see from there, again, I didn't want to overload you, but what you can see is that the, 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 the yes votes are declining. So we see, but it's still an overwhelming majority of, of, of yes for any compensation package. So most companies vote yes. The, you know, the number of no votes are rising from, say, 90% to maybe 85, 82%. So that's the picture right now. Um, you know, there are this research in the Anglo-Saxon context that looks at stock market responses, you know, abnormal returns. We can't do that. We have two companies where it's been rejected. In general, if you're interested in this type of stuff, um, they find a positive uh, abnormal return for a yes and a vice versa. But we can study this in certain first off, you know, kind of calculating the particular compensation is, it's intransparent. We can't really, you know. Sum it up. I mean, you can, but you know, you do this black hole stuff, and it, 
you know, we don't have the numbers really to be 100% sure what the final numbers are. And we don't have variance in this variable. So we have two companies that got rejected. We have um, SMI, com we have many companies that don't vote at all, you know, that, okay. yeah. That's, that, that's what the yeah, interest absolutely. was because also from initiatives like the uh, principles for responsible investment, that they forced also asset managers to vote. Right. Um, does it make sense in Switzerland or not? Uh, it's, it's Look, like, I'd say no. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. It's, it's, it's also a cost, and uh, at the end, it's uh, the Absolutely. same. Absolutely, you have a very, very entrenched ownership structure in Switzerland. Okay. I mean, how much can you? I mean, what what can you achieve, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. As a pension, if you have, you know, many companies where three shareholders decide everything, or many companies with really a very dominant major shareholder. So you should be an active shareholder if well, you're not a free yourself. And, uh, <laughs> yes, no. You know, you should not. Well, that's my personal stake, and now it gets made a little political. And you know, I, I mean, from what I know, I would not want to have it imposed on either pension funds or any other constituency because I think it's it's useless. It's what's left. So if you want to have you know more say on pay, we should look at the dual class shares and voting restrictions. So that's the first thing to consider. Um, the fact that a lot of pension funds can be in the 64.9%. Excuse me? A lot of pension fund holdings could be in the 64.9% basically because they are investing through investment funds? Yeah, but they're not the largest shareholder. So this is the largest shareholder. But you say, on the other side, you say that pension funds were not large enough, but as a general mass, I don't know if the number exists, how much of the voting right represents pension fund down? Because maybe they are very fractional, but in if you know. So an average not in largest shareholder, but in total shareholder. Um, and then, you know, because they you we only disclose about mm -hmm. three or five percent maybe you know. You know, I, I never I know what you mean, you're trying to say in the market, in the entire market yes. thing. You know, I, I kind of I don't really understand this. I mean, I had a lot of people saying this. Yes, in the entire market, they hold a large amount of shares. Like a fraction. But in each and every, every company, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're analyzing unit. You're decisive when it comes to say a An overview of largest, how it drops to the second largest, and you know, you know, when, you know, what happens when they are the largest, who is the largest shareholder. And if you look at 2.6, just the gap, it doesn't change dramatically. Yeah, my question was on the identity of the institutional investors. Um, you mean? I mean, with this graph. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether these shares moved between 2006 and 2011. I know, it has to check. I guess I didn't, I didn't look at it because the distribution was small, right? And then I was, I was interested, you know, to what extent do they have a discipline effect? Mm -hmm. And if I see one, well, it's just 10.8%, and kind of, yeah, you know, it's, it's a very, but I could, if you're interested, I could look, maybe look it up. I, I you know, I could look it up in the latest, but I haven't constructed, I, I talked initially about how attached investors are to the company or what time horizon they are. Mm -hmm. Have you compared who the largest is and how long he has been in that position? Because I, I guess investment funds probably don't have a, such a long time horizon as well, it depends. companies or families. Or uh, well, could you, could you just paraphrase the question because I didn't hear the yeah. How long have these largest investors been in that position? Uh, I don't have the numbers for how long they have been. It's just more of a general wisdom. Um, as a family, you know, you you're a founder, and then you your son takes over, maybe third generation. Then you have a foundation, family owners that controls it. So that's the standard. So the, the answer is never. If your company is profitable. You know, if you can get a giant dividend, why would you do that? And other, other investing types, um, institutions, companies. So, 
there is no years in my data set, so that's not something I can tell it, but I tend to talk to private equity people because I'm interested in ownership, right? And I've talked to particularly that was I think Prozine Science and the guy says, Oh, we have a large investment horizon. So I go, so how long is how large, how long is long? He says six years. You know? Um, it's very industry dependent as well. You know, depending on a project. So for example, utilities, you know, anything that needs a lot of money, you know, there you tend to have shareholders that have this kind of giant large investment horizons. Um, you know, I, I don't have, so I can't really answer the question, I don't have the years, but you know, if you, if you look at the general wisdom is pension funds have a large investment horizon, by nature, right, a long investment horizon. Private equity hedge funds are on the kind of shorter time frame, shorter, you know, kind of on this on this other continuum. And I mean, you know, six years. If they when they say six years, that means they have a lot of time at their So usually it's probably shorter. Um, state owners, that's a matter of privatization. Oftentimes they stay where they are. When it comes to say on pay, um, the results are unequivocal. We have there's a lot of research on compensation in family firms. And you have two camps of researchers. One saying, well, this is, these are you know, the stewards of the company. They preserve company wealth. And they're going to pay less. Because you know, they, you know, they, they, part of their motivation or part of their kind of interest in the company is what they call social emotional wealth. You know, they kind of, they, 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 they want to be in control. So that's the reward that they have. It's an emotional attachment. So therefore, you can kind of, they compensated by this emotional attachment. I know it's very academic. Apologies for that, but you know, and therefore they this camp finds lower average compensation, you know, in family firms. You have another camp, and I'm not a family business person. You have another camp that says we have giant principal principal giant agency problems in family firms. Why? They appoint offspring that are not qualified. They're not the best talented people. Uh, they tend to, you know, enjoy perks. They tend to kind of save enough wealth to themselves. They create giant agency, you know, problems, and they pay a lot. Within, you know, they kind of tend to have higher pay and lower pay performance sensitivity. Within this camp, you will find, and I think that's probably the most kind of decent result, is that it changes a lot of whether you have the founder, first generation, or the second generation. There's something called the Boddenbrooks effect that says the founder preserves. And then the further you know down the line you go, the more they dissipate. Crack gets closed. Mm -hmm. Family business is a portion. But I'm not a family business person, so um, yeah, I tend to be you know, usual. So many family business people are very ardent about that, so that they would tell you why this is so beneficial, why this is cool. We conducted this study comparing firm value in terms of token Q and ownership structures, and we find in the Swiss context on Swiss data that um, the best combination is you have family ownership and professional management. And relative to dispersed shareholdings, where we claim management is under control, so no disciplinary effect, full family control, so family control, family management, or institutional investor. So we claim you have you know, the incentive of the family to kind of preserve firm value, but you have professional management that kind of brings in knowledge. And, and we find this is the best. Um, arrangement in the Swiss context. Best in terms of uh, share performance? Yes, in terms of token skew. So when you come relative to the others, and it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a multinomial model to so compare relative to the other category, and this one is the best. Family? Professional management, yeah. I mean, I have a paper on that if you want it. It's, it's nastily academic. <laughs> it's been published <laughs> a couple of months ago. Shall we? Sure, we can. Um, let me wrap up this shortly. So, um, institutional investors are frequently a frequent occurrence. But they they don't hold. They don't. They are not frequently the largest shareholder. They don't hold as much as many voting rights. Um, the largest shareholders are held by other companies, family shareholders. The smallest stakes are actually in the hands of institutional investors. Pension funds, that's what we were talking about, is another frequent occurrence. 
or I'd sell them for lunch, surely, but that's how I have to do it. And then please bear in mind this whole thing is about pay performance sensitivity. It's not about the whole compensation, it's about pay performance. You know, we want to have a sensitivity. Ideally, when performance goes down, compensation should go down, not just, you know, the pay compensation cap. Um, <coughs> well, you know, the institutional investors that have been claimed, you know, have been ascribed a very, very um, strong disciplining effect and probably have this disciplining effect in the Anglo-Saxon context are, I guess, less powerful in Switzerland, according to the description. Expropriation and private benefits of control. Inside, this is a short one. Um, in terms of attention span. <laughs> um, so this is insight number three. State and family owners use instruments to buttress their power, creating room for entrenchment and the pursuit of private benefits of control. So what is private benefits of control? What do we mean by this? Well, that's when you have your cost shares. You are disproportionately invested. You have less investments than control rights, right? So you kind of, you, you invest less cash, but you have more of a say. That's what we call a batch between cash and control rights. And this creates incentives, and that's a finance term. So don't blame me, I'm a manager who's a strategy person. And the, the central claim is it creates an incentive to engage what's called private benefits and control to kind of, if you want to, um, to do stuff like related private transaction, transaction, nepotism, tunneling, corruption, to siphon off wealth for themselves or to related parties or to other companies. So why? Because you know you're in, you you have a disproportionate incentive. You have you, you don't hold as many. You're not invested in as much capital as you actually control. So that's what's meant. The, 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 with um, a, a wedge between cash and control rights. Um, the idea is that if you have such a situation, then this creates disadvantages to minority shareholders. In general, such firms are penalized by the um, financial markets in terms of Tobin's Q, for example. And this is disadvantages for minority investors, and that's oftentimes, it's, it's, there's a lot of research, and it's called expropriation of minority investors. And usually when people compare corporate governance context and they look at, so what's the incidence of dual clause shares, voting restrictions, and the like? Uh, and from this, they infer what is the quality you know, of, of, of minority shareholder protection rights. And Switzerland has always been, there's there are important, very important famous studies on this starting from in the, in the 90s, it's always been on the you know, bottom, bottom um, uh, level of the of the continuum because of you know <laughs> a very very um, frequent use of dual class shares and voting restrictions. And if you look at this, this is a 2006, and the situation has gotten better. And you see um, percentage of companies with dual class shares and voting restrictions, and then you see that well about 35 percent have voting restrictions, and about this is a 15. I apologize, we don't see it here. About 15, well, yeah, 14, 15 percent have had dual cost shares. So Anglo-Saxon context typically zero. Um, Korean, Japanese context, they have cost share holdings, five holdings, KVXs and the like. So that's another story. That's if you went on the other continuum. But Switzerland, along with Sweden, by the way, is one of the countries that <coughs> have this. And um, you know, if you want to complain about the Swiss context, that's I mean, that's what, you know, Anglo-Saxon investors usually complain, that there is a lot of, you know, um, well, the minority shareholder rights are not as well protected as they should. How does it compare to Germany or Australia? I don't know. Um, I, 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 I would have to guess. Uh, I know I have read a paper in, in Italy, and Italy is, you know, totally, you know, cross-shareholding stuff, so... Italy is really kind of like Korea. Um, Germany has changed a lot, I think, because after the you know Germany AG, they have um, a, a large, large you know kind of influx of foreign capital. So I would expect that these guys have abolished you know um, the wedge between cash and control. Less, but I don't know it by heart. I would have to look that. But I know that um, you know there, there is a, the first time someone has really there, Four guys that made a career of this. Um, 
they're usually referred to by an acronym, LLS LLSB, I don't know if someone knows this, Laporte, Lopez, Silanus, Vishni, poor, poor guys. And they have actually, they have investigated context by context, you know, European countries, Asian countries, um, the Anglo-Saxon context. And when it comes to this type of restrictions, so that was in the 90s, way before 2006, Switzerland was like, whoa, you know, this is bad, Switzerland, Sweden. So I guess Germany is better. In terms of dual class shares and voting rights, not when, you know, not, you know, board composition stuff, that's not an um, issue. But, but here, um, and I think that's it's gotten better. Now, percentage of companies with dual class shares, where the large shares, so if you look at, so who is actually the one who wants this dual class shares? Who is kind of entrenching themselves? Then you see, see in terms of dual class shares is family companies. So when the large shareholder is a family, you're going to have in 27.3% of cases, you're going to have dual class shares. And this is pretty natural, so institutional investors don't pay for this. That's um, anyway, actually, when it comes to voting restrictions, then state owners are very prominent. And here, um, the prominent examples are cantonal banks. Many people maybe don't know that, but you know, cantonal banks usually no one has the right to vote beside the canton. So that's a very, and we have a lot of, you know, a lot of cantonal banks among the 135 countries. So, um, you know, Swisscom, the state has. Um, voting restrictions, where really you can't vote more than a certain uh, level of shares. That's a pretty standard procedure. It also happens uh, um, in family firms. Uh, interestingly, voting restrictions are also here for institutional investors. That sounds good. But less if we do the cost shares. Finding summary. The distribution of dual class shares something amongst these companies has remained relatively stable. The, the use of voting rights has uh, slightly de decreased. Um, as I just said, frequent occurrence where a shareholder is a family, voting restrictions associated with uh, state companies. This leaves a lot of, this leaves a lot, this leaves some room for the pursuit of private benefits of control. Let's say it's not as advantageous, it's not as advanced in terms of a minority shareholder uh, protection, but maybe more important, it creates a very, very stable situation where things cannot easily be changed. So you have large block holdings, dominant owners and these owners entrench themselves by voting restrictions and dual class shares. And you have a very low number of institutions, well, you know, you know pension funds are meaningless as large as shareholders. So this, and, and it's been stable for the last five years, for the last 10 years. Um, I've talked to a person, um, to a compensation consultant from HKP, Ostrichter in Portland, and then I asked him, so um, are they bracing themselves? And we have to say, okay, are they getting nervous? Are they hiring you know, compensation consultants, proxy solicitors? And he says no. And the reason is this. My guess. Conclusion. What to expect? Um, I think it legitimizes shareholder involvement. If you ask Dominic Biedermann from Ethos, he's going to say it's become more fancy, more acceptable to say no. You know, some 10, 15 years ago, no shareholder in the Swiss context would go to an AGM and you know, cry, I don't like you. Now it's become fancy, and people follow. Um, Ethos issues recommendations, people read this. Ethos, in terms of capital, is not a giant, but everybody knows these guys, and everybody knows their recommendations. So they have become from it's become legitimate to say no. This dream leaves room for activists, for foreign investors. You know, from the Anglo-Saxon context, we're used of having a say, we're used of getting involved, and they may take, you know, advantage of these empowered, of, of these kind of increased shareholder rights. Electronic AGMs, for example. They might use that because they have the culture of, the, the, the habit of doing this. Um, it has actually spurred the dialogue. So speaking of, you know, I think there was a vote here. So we see that, you know, the, the, the yes votes have decreased. So what happens, you, you're, as a company, you don't necessarily need a no for your compensation. It suffices that you see, oh, the support is going down. So what happens is you're going to reach out to them. You know, you're going to talk to them. You're going to try to, you know, you're going to talk to ethos. You're going to talk to rating agencies you know, to, to give you a better rate. You're going to manage expectations whatever that means, you're going to manage your pressure, you're going to try, you're going to hire compensation consultants, 
you're going to hire proxy solicitors. So I think there's, there's going to be more activity. You don't need to have your compensation rejected, but you don't want to be in the press saying, oh, they have received just 55% of the vote. So it has an effect. Yes, it does have an effect. It's just not, you know, an the effect that people, you know, people thought it's going to cap compensation. It won't. Um, I think the level will likely remain the same, and that's probably okay. High pay, high, you know, high performance, high pay. How a high per pay performance sensitivity, you know, the lower pay, the lower compensation, the lower performance, the lower pay, this should, might become a little better with increased discipline and affect the shareholders, however symbolic it may be. Um, radical changes, excuse me, are maybe, um, ex are, are going to be really an exception rather than a rule. Um, Daniel Vassella, you know, is an, is an example with his um, anti-competition laws where, you know, really kind of, it was a public pressure. So this, I think it's really kind of started off, a, a, you know, it's a legitimacy issue. It's just become okay to, you know, rant about compensation. And this is why, in some cases, you might have a really a giant effect. But this is going to be an exception. So what do you want to look for when you look at a company? So what is a well-owned company, you know? You want to look, uh, you know, look at who is the largest shareholder, because we know it's been talking about Swiss context. We know that the largest holds about thirty percent of the shares. So, who is the largest shareholder? Um, how large is the stake? And then think of preferences. Think of interest heterogeneity, which you said. You know, think of its family. What the families want. You know, this is going to impact the, the compensation structure. And compensation structure again is going to impact the strategy, right? So if you're a family, you're going to want to have all the LL tip. If you have an LL tip, you're going to have you know, different <coughs> decisions. Um, who are the other block holders? Who is number two, number three, number four? Because we have a lot of other block holders. And how stable is this coalition? Are they able to reach an agreement? Imagine a situation where you have a large foreign investor coming in. You know, who is going to side with whom? You know, think uh, Schmaltz and Bickenbach. Now, who is going to side with, with Wechselberg and who not? I mean, I think coalitions, this is going to be a prominent thing in a Swiss context. And then have a look at whether large shareholders are represented on board. This gives them more power, better access to information, which may be you know, good, because they know the situation better. They are there. But they also might entrench themselves, right? They might kind of, kind of fend off anybody, intruders. Um, and what means do shareholders have at their disposal to protect their interests or entrench themselves? That means how prevalent are dual clause shares, how prevalent are both restrictions. So that's what you have to look for when you want to know if you have a well-owned company in your portfolio. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, thank you very much, Kate. Time for a, a couple of questions. Yes, um, I was wondering if there's a theory on why there's such a difference in uh, ownership structure between Anglo-Saxon countries and Europe. Is it uh, cultural? Uh, is it because um, I don't know uh, pension funds have less prominence in Europe, it, uh, less, less weight? Is it market death? Is it uh, culture in the sense that? Big investors in, in Anglo-Saxon countries prefer to have uh, the diversified their holdings, whereas in Europe they prefer to go all in for a long time in one company and hold a lot of power. How it, are there any theories on that? I'm just thinking. Um, I mean, there is there is a lot of theory about why investors have been largely passive in the Anglo-Saxon world. So it's been traditionally dispersed. With a lot of passive investors. You now we're talking 20 years ago, right? Before this whole corporate governance movement started off. Um, you know, why are ownership structures such as they are? Well, you know, I think it's really historic. I mean, if you look at some of the really old companies that are still, you know, on, on some stock exchange, so many of these are mergers of some even older companies. Um, it's probably been historic that you have, you know, this lot. I mean, 
what drives ownership concentration? It's mainly family business, right? So that's that's family business and state owned, you know. If you know before deregulation. That's that's what drives it. And that's a historic issue in, 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 in Europe. Um, are there theories? I would answer it historically, but I don't know. You know what what what, what the historic driver was. Because you could say that, for example, those families, uh, it's a big risk for them to have all of their wealth in one company. Maybe in Anglo-Saxon countries, they prefer to die best, like uh, Bill Gates is doing right now with his Microsoft stock. He's slowly and slowly every year trying to diversify it. Whereas uh, maybe that's not something that uh, you would know, have done with the or want to. No, I just I just wanted to what extent is it about the popularity of the stock market as an instrument to raise yeah. capital? You know, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the overwhelming power of financial markets that we know them now. I know you're a financial analyst, but that wasn't the case um, 50, 60, 100 years ago. You know, we are only now become a financy society. You know. Um, I was wondering, perhaps I can offer a, another uh, kind of explanation. Uh, if you look at the sample that you're looking at, 100 what, 38 uh, firms. Uh, so uh, basically, the size effect will play a role here. There will be a lot of many, ma uh, uh, many small firms in there, whereas in the U.S. Uh, you have a huge concentration of uh, really huge firms. Right. So I think that that size effect might uh, might also play a role. And as a large firm, you, you have more needs to raise capital, where to raise capital on the stock market. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting question only, or also is why they have been so passive, and that's because the law forbade it. You know, the, 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 the American context, they didn't want shareholders to, you know, kind of concert and engage in collective action. They wanted, they wanted them to... Um, yeah, that, that's that's really the explanation why there was no shareholder engagement. And then um, people would say, well, it's not because they are not interested, because you know they are they are the you know the efficient model holds it. It's the most efficient way to way to organize a company. Shareholders, risk bearers, managers, managers, and the board is something in between. And then there is a, a whole bunch of people from the political sides, you know, is going to say, well, no, you know, law separated ownership not efficiency because they were not allowed to get involved or to talk to each other, to concert with them, to engage in collective action. And so when this has changed, and some scholars have shown that, then this whole kind of shareholder rights movement has taken off. Which probably in Europe is a different thing because you have higher levels of concentration. We have time for one final question if somebody wants to raise it. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, it's not a question, it's just a comment regarding the uh, same on the initiative. And, I mean, it's a common knowledge, and then you are an academic, an academic, so maybe you can confirm it or not. But that, I mean, managers' performance and companies' performance uh, at the end is 60% of uh, I mean, economic environment, 40% of executives, management, and, and so on. So, l l linking, uh, I mean, executives' performance and salary seems very obvious. But at the end, I mean, are there not in, any other criteria that would be uh, relevant to, uh, I mean, to match to this study? I guess we're moving a little bit away from the ownership structure, right? So, mm -hmm. It's yeah. more of the executive. Yeah, way, I, yeah. I, I, yeah to, to, you know, that, that's salient, that's salient, because uh, you, you know, we, executive compensation like another topic. Um, I might not have touched on some very, very, very important issues. I agree when it comes to executive compensation, but I was going to show you ownership data. Okay. When it comes to what you are saying, and this is, you know, economically that means what percentage of variance is explained by executive effort and what by, you know, other variables. Um, yeah, well, I guess, you know, a lot of, a lot, I mean, you know, how, I mean, it's, it's a debatable question, you know, how large is their impact? How how much can, you know? How much is random, right? Particularly when it comes you know to stock market performance. How much are exogenous shocks? Um, certainly a lot. But that said, you know the idea. It's, it's not entirely wrong.
to think that that if you want executives to focus on long-term investments, to invest in innovation, to invest in research and development that does not pay off, to link part of their incentive structure to some measure of long-term performance. It does not have to be a stock price. You know, um, it, it can be a different another measure, an accounting-based measure or some other benchmark. But you know, the mere idea that you wanna you wanna link his reward or if you want punishment, which is the other side, to strategic goals at the corporate level, I think it has its merits. And, and we do find these relationships, you know, in, in, uh, on average, on a, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a, for example, if you look at compensation R&D, compensation structure, you know, long-term, short-term, fixed variable, and innovation, charity contributions, all this stuff, that's pretty, it's pretty neat a relationship when you find that. You know, if you compensate by stock options, no one's gonna invest in R&D. I mean, it's it's a truth, you know. High upside potential, low downside risk. You know, stock options lose their incentive once they go beyond the, you know, below a certain threshold. So, and then you have to think, who who is gonna favor stock options as a compensation mechanism? And then I think ownership structure and preference heterogeneity. So the answer is yes. And um, Chris knows me, like I'm a very much in, in, in favor of executives. I like them. You know, I'm not a managerialist. I think you know they're gonna do a good job. Some of them are enthusiasts. But there is merits to say, look, I know, I give you stock in my company if you do if you you know, if you make sure you do a long term story. That that's that would be my take on that. I don't wanna answer your question. Very good. So um, we can now um, Close the formal part of the, um, the presentation. I would like to thank Kate uh, again very much for, for a very me. fascinating and obviously uh, a very um, timely uh, topic. And, and based on on the um, on the number of excellent questions, clearly it was interesting for, for you. So now, um, with that, I would like to thank you for attending, <coughs> and uh, we can now um, um, go next door for the buffet luncheon. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.